So it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Um, you know, Larry, I apologize. I didn't hear your entire uh, introduction. So this may be a little redundant, but I um, want to let you know a little bit more about me. I've been in the field of providing employment services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities for over 40 years now. And uh, it seems like it was just yesterday when I started. Uh, I also have a son who has Down syndrome, who is 20 years old this year, and uh, next year will be 21, and uh, getting out of the school system. And one of his big dreams, as you might imagine, is to have a job. Uh, the, the dream that he's trying to implement right now is to get out of the house with mom and dad. And so about, uh, about four months ago, he moved down into our guest quarters in our, in our basement, which is a garden level kind of situation. And uh, that satisfied him for a few months, but he continuously is telling us now that he wants to completely move out of our home. I, I remember when I was 20, it was a while ago, but uh, certainly I had those same kinds of feelings myself. So the perspective I bring is not just a professional perspective, but also one of having a uh, family member who experiences uh, an intellectual disability. I, uh, I hope that, you, you know, I'm not sure how much information you have on, on some of these issues, but uh, we're at a, a kind of a crossroads here in Colorado when it comes to employment services for people. We were very, very successful in the state in the 1990s. And since then, have not had a great deal of success in expanding employment opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So this presentation is a little bit of history because we were actually, Colorado was a, a leading state in this area uh, 20 years ago. And uh, it's, it's kind of discouraging that we aren't uh, much further along than we are now. Uh, first slide, please. So I want to let you know what our rights are. Since uh, 1990, with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we've had a right to have our sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, served in integrated settings. Now, uh, unfortunately, most states, in fact, all states, have pretty much ignored this. The interesting thing is that a person by the name of Lois Curtis in uh, 1997 decided that she was going to press the issue, and so took the issue to court in Atlanta, Georgia. Excuse me. Lois Curtis basically said that she didn't want to continue to live in an institution. And uh, Tommy Olmsted, who was the head of the Human Services Department in Georgia, decided he was going to fight that. Well. Uh, as you might imagine, Lois was successful. It resulted in a Supreme Court ruling that clarified the fact that people with disabilities, when you're using public dollars to provide services, have a right to be in community. And this most integrated setting uh, piece that you see up here was kind of established. and. Uh, Basically, it, it said that for these public services, state and local funded services, people in housing, people in employment, people in recreation need to be served in the most integrated setting possible. It's the law of the land, and, and most states don't follow that law. The only reason I say most states, I'd say all states, except that some states have been sued and are working on becoming legal, so they're technically not illegal anymore, even though they aren't uh, in compliance yet, but they are working toward compliance, and so technically they're not illegal anymore. But um, this also, and, and, and the courts 
weren't quite clear on whether this applied to employment initially because it was uh, based on, the ruling was based on uh, an Atlanta institution. But in fact, uh, since then, the interpretation has come through loud and clear that it does apply to employment and day services and, and all services, basically. Next slide, please. Next slide. Anybody here know Clarence? So uh, a few people. Uh, Clarence, uh, of course, the two of you do. I didn't see who you were. Uh, Clarence and I went around the country uh, throughout the 90s and uh, the first decade uh, plus uh, here in the 2000s and talked about his experiences in sheltered workshops. Clarence ended up uh, being in three different sheltered workshops. He always wanted to be in, in a community job and people blocked that all the way through. And by people, I mean the service system, professionals, basically always telling him that he needed to go to a sheltered workshop. Well, Clarence got sick of it and uh, started to go around with me to talk about some of the, really what I would characterize as inhumane conditions that he had to deal with by being segregated all the time during the day. So this is a quote from Clarence. Um, Clarence would often say, this is, is ridiculous. Uh, and certainly he said that during many of the presentations that we did together around the country. Next slide, please. So one of the exciting things I have here to tell you tonight is that on October 31st of this year, we had really definitive guidance coming from the Department of Justice. And that was very exciting because these things are not real clear sometimes. You know, we get a, we get a court decision in 99, but we continue to have all the states kind of dragging their, their feet as far as implementation. So this is just a little bit of information. I'm not going to go through it, but it, it speaks to some of the technical aspects about this most integrated setting uh, guidance. And uh, the, the bullet at the bottom is uh, important tonight because really what this new guidance put together was that a lot of the things that we see in Colorado right now during the day for people, they basically decided are not in compliance with Olmstead and with the Americans with Disabilities Act. What isn't in, in compliance is the CIE, Community Integrated Employment. And uh, it's interesting because the federal government now, through the Department of Labor, with the recent uh, WIOA legislation, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, as well as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, mm -hmm. and then the Department of Justice, the legal side, have all been trying to get these definitions put together that are consistent and that provide consistent guidance to the states. So what we know now is this concept of CIE or Community Integrated Employment does fulfill the legal requirements of Olmstead, even though this actual definition appears in the, in the Federal Department of Labor uh, regulations. Next slide, please. So this is what it is. They really are defining, and this is how it applies to, to integration, they're really defining employment as the same employment that we all know as employment. We're not talking about sheltered workshops where people are grouped together. We're not talking about mobile work crews or enclaves, again, where people are grouped together in groups. What we're talking about here is a regular job. Now, a lot of times families come up to me and they say, well, my son or daughter, they, they can't do a regular job. And so part of the, some of the slides here that we'll get onto in just a few moments will describe to you why that's not the case anymore. Why it is true now that anybody who desires to work can work with these concepts that Larry referred to called supported employment, but also customized employment. And so we'll talk about that just a little bit. But basically this definition of community integrated employment says that people with disabilities have a right to have the same kind of social interactions on the job that anybody else has. People without disabilities, the same social experience. You can't have those kinds of social experiences when you're segregated in a warehouse in a sheltered workshop. You can't have those kinds of social experiences with coworkers when you are grouped in a group of five or eight or three people and that social availability of, of connection is just not available to people 
when they are grouped like that. Next slide, please. So these are some of the non-compliant services that have been clarified in this recent uh, information, guidance from the Department of Justice. Sheltered workshops, uh, here in Colorado we call that pre-vocational services. Uh, don't be fooled, it's still a sheltered workshop. And then group employment, these enclaves or these work crews, these smaller groups of people with disabilities working together, are also not consistent with this concept of com competitive integrated employment. They also mention in the guidance that groups of people going into the community during the day are not compliant with the most integrated setting concept. The reason that this is important for employment is that how do many of us get jobs? It's not what we know, it's who we know. How do we develop those social relations? Well, we develop them in places like this where we introduce ourselves to, to people and a variety of different community settings. But that's not happening when we have groups of people going out to volunteer or to walk around the mall or to do whatever these day service, services may have our sons and daughters doing. You, you can't connect to people that way. So this is all about individualization, not having groups of people, not having people segregated in any way, but having people with individualized services. Bottom line is, is that 90% of the people served by state services in this state right now are not in compliance with this most integrated setting concept. And the Department of Justice is clarifying this for us. Next slide, please. Where are we at? Well, we saw a lot of progress back in the late 80s and early 90s around the country. A lot of progress, but in fact, we still have hundreds of thousands of people segregated throughout the country right now. The interesting thing is that there are wide differences between states. So you'll see in Alabama, 5% of the people served in that state are served in what's called supported employment, which actually includes some of that group enclave stuff. And in Washington state, you see the, the Statistic is 84% of all people in Washington state who have an intellectual and developmental disability who are served by the state are served in supported employment, in community employment kinds of situations. So is there something magic about Washington or is there something really wrong with Alabama? No, it's, 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 it's not that they have some magic wand in, in Washington and it's not that everybody uh, is, is automatically segregated coming out of school in Alabama. What, anybody have an, any idea what, what the difference is? Money? Advocates? Advocates? State, the state system? The, the state reaction? The, the state regulations and laws that might be in place? Next slide, please. This gives you a feel for some of the states and how they're performing right now. I don't absolutely trust the Colorado figure because somehow they jumped by eight points over one year and I have not seen evidence of that. But regardless, you can see that Washington is the top, we're kind of in the middle, and then you see some states that are really underperforming in this area. And again, this is the percentage of people served by the states who have intellectual and developmental disabilities who are in supported employment, who are in community-based employment. Sometimes group, sometimes individualized, but are in community. Next slide, please. This gives you a feel for how, how it's happened in the US over the years. We hit a peak up at the turn of the century, and we have gradually come down across the United States. Next slide, please. This is what happened in Colorado. Wowie. We had a peak, 95, 96. And then we come down and uh, have hovered around 20, between 20 and 25%. As I say, the latest statistic that just came out for Colorado is 33%, but I, I don't have that put on here because I haven't been able to confirm it yet. So what in the heck happened back in the mid-90s? Next slide, please. This is the, the analysis of what happened in Colorado from Windsor, Butterworth, and Hall that they published in 2005 because they noticed Colorado being very, very successful in the 90s 
and this steep decline in our effectiveness when it came to employment. These are the things that they determined were happening, is that we had training and technical assistance happening throughout the state in the 90s. Getting information out to people, both agencies and professionals, but also families and case managers in the system, the people who help us make decisions about our sons and daughters. There was a policy of no new funding for segregated sheltered workshops. That policy went away. There were fiscal incentives for providers and for businesses. The Division for Developmental Disabilities had a dedicated full-time person who did nothing but facilitated the expansion of integrated employment for our sons and daughters. And finally, there was a higher level of collaboration between the primary agencies responsible at the local level, the community center boards, and then at the state level, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and the Division for Developmental Disabilities. Next slide, please. So what do self-advocates have to say about this? Are people familiar with self-advocates becoming empowered? Anyone? Not many, but let me tell you, this is the national organization that uh, uh, is, is based, you know, here in Colorado, we have uh, local chapters, self-advocacy chapters. They all feed into Colorado Speaking for Ourselves. And then one of our members within Colorado Speaking for Ourselves is actually a board member for SABE, for Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered of the USA. This is their policy that they put together in 2009. And you'll hear some similar things about what I've already been talking about. No new people going into sheltered workshops. Immediately, no new people can join an enclave. This is that group employment stuff. An ending of subminimum wage by 2012 and ending all enclaves by 2014. Does anybody, does anybody think this has happened? No, it has not happened. But this is what the National Self-Advocacy Group has been calling for. Next slide, please. Chester Finn said, other groups fighting for their civil rights would not stand for separate places, neither should we. Chester is a great uh, self-advocate who is no longer president, but was president back in the uh, 2009, 2010, and 2011, I believe. Next slide, please. Eve Hill was with the Department of Justice when Rhode Island was investigated several years ago. And her statement is, unfortunately, the exploitation and tyranny of low expectations we found in Rhode Island are all are an all too common result of the segregation of people with disabilities. Now I've bolded this to, to try to make it clear about what she's saying. Low expectations result from segregation. When business people see our sons and daughters in groups of people running around the community, their expectations for our sons and daughters are lowered. When we see our sons and daughters in those kinds of service situations, it's very easy for our expectations for our sons and daughters to be lowered. This just isn't right because our sons and daughters have enough of a struggle to get through life with high quality without having to have low expectations put upon them because of a service system that is not functioning the way it should, and in fact is illegal. Next slide, please. So what are we doing right now? Well, Colorado, as Mary Jo knows very well because Mary Jo helped us get this passed in the last session, Colorado now has an employment first bill. It's Senate Bill 16-077. Basically, employment first, you can see the definition, is a framework for change, and it's basically state change that's centered on the premise that all persons, including people with significant disabilities, are capable of full participation in competitive integrated employment and community life. There's that word again, that phrase, competitive integrated employment, CIE. Employment in the general workforce is the first and preferred option, or excuse me, outcome for all working age persons with disabilities regardless of level of disability. Next slide, please. 
this Employment First Advisory Partnership is the way that this is implemented. And that kicks off Mary Jo's, Mary Jo is on that, uh, I'm on it as well. And uh, we have our first meeting in mid-January where we hope to organize and then move rapidly forward, I hope, to, because November 1st is gonna be here like tomorrow. And basically what is expected of the bill is that we put together recommendations to improve employment services here in Colorado within a, uh, whatever it is, a 10 month uh, period. It will be very, very challenging. Some of the people that are supposed to be on the EFAP are right here. This is directly from the bill. So you can see we have advocates for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities on there, as well as uh, other individuals. Next slide, please. There's the, the bottom line for states moving in the right direction, and this is what we experienced uh, back in the 90s here in Colorado, is to have a clear policy that encourages employment for people. We call it employment first nowadays. To make sure that there's adequate technical assistance and training so that not only do staff people understand what the potential is for people, but also we as families and our sons and daughters understand what the potential is. Unfortunately, the school districts have not done a great job of understanding the potential that our sons and daughters have when it comes to employment. And although we've seen improvement over the years here in Colorado in transition services, they're still not up to snuff. They're still not what they should be. In fact, best practice for transition services now is for every person with a disability to leave school with a paid job. That's best practice right now. Doesn't happen very often here in Colorado, I can assure you. Effective rate structures with cost covering fees and incentives for, perform for performance along with state employment day services resource be rebalancing. All that last phrase is speaking to is looking at the money we have and reorganizing it in a way that supports people getting jobs. Next slide, please. H.L. Mencken said, when somebody says it's not about the money, it's about the money. Next slide, please. So the, these are some of the, the funding related things that are based on research, are based on best practice, that need to happen. The final bullet is something I've become increasingly concerned about and, and increasingly persuaded that it's true is that over time, and we've had 20 years of this now, over time when rates continue to be too low to support employment services for people, we ought to start considering it discrimination, state-sponsored discrimination against our sons and daughters. Next slide. So it's just a little bit about some of this technology and some of the things we know about helping people find jobs. We've actually known this since the 80s and we implemented it here in Colorado in the 90s, and then everybody forgot about it. Tragic. Supported employment refers to paid work in integrated settings with ongoing non-time limited support. So that, that last phrase is just uh, reflective of the, and that's really what supported employment is, is it's ongoing support where we check in on individuals who have a job to make sure things are going okay. We check in with the person and their family to make sure they think things are going okay in the job. We check in with the employer to make sure things are going okay with the job. If both parties are satisfied, then we know things are going okay with the job. But if you find that either the individual and or their family have picked up on things not going well on the job, then you come in and you, and you intervene. You assist that person. You provide the support necessary to get things back on track. Job matches the focus. My agency, Community Link, served a guy, and this is when we still had a sheltered workshop. We closed, we, we actually began our sheltered workshops in 1960. We closed them in 1996. But before they were closed, we had a gentleman come in to the sheltered workshop, and within the first week, he had had several incidents where he had punched holes in a wall and then kicked holes in another wall. This is a person who has a label of autism. 
He is a person who had a difficult time communicating, except, of course, what do you think he was communicating to us? That maybe this wasn't a good situation for him, that maybe he needed a different situation of some kind than a segregated, sheltered workshop with a bunch of people with disabilities in a very loud environment. Um, it, wasn't a good, it wasn't a good match for him. He went through three different programs in Denver and then came to us. We decided to listen to what he was telling us through his behavior, and he has successfully worked at Wells Fargo as a coin processor for just over 20 years. He has, had, had been, he has been very successful, but he does a job that basically involves putting coins into a coin processor and taking out the rolled coins and putting them into a box, something he really enjoys doing. He has some interesting math skills, and so he basically can add up uh, all those rolls of quarters and dimes and, and pennies uh, at the end of the day, and he's never off by more than a couple of cents, if that. So job match is very important. Figuring out what somebody likes to do, enjoys doing, and making sure, you know, the bank is a quiet place, that he needs that to feel comfortable. Um, it also includes ideas like self-employment, where a gentleman down in Texas is doing a coffee service for Motorola, and his, uh, his volitional physical movement is this. He can smile but he can't do anything else. So he has an attendant, but he owns a coffee machine, a fancy coffee machine that does espresso and all, all the kinds of uh, stuff that people like nowadays. And he makes a very good business through self-employment by having his attendant, he's hired his attendant to keep that coffee machine cleaned and filled and, and, and running through, I believe it's eight different shifts of breaks that come through in this assembly plant, basically. So he's making a very good living. But does he have any ability except to smile? No. But he owns the means of production. He, he's a guy who has been able to purchase uh, a, a valuable uh, piece of equipment that, that people are willing to pay money for the product that comes out of it. Supported employment can also include customized employment. Next slide. Customized employment really means that everybody can work. And the reason for that is because customized employment involves a negotiation between an employer and a person with a disability to make sure that their, both of their needs are met. But oftentimes it involves significantly different position description than what might typically be there and the position description is based on what a person with a disability can do quite well. Or it might involve a schedule that's consi considerably lessened. Instead of an eight-hour day schedule, it might be a four-hour day schedule. But there are ways to build these position descriptions and these schedules in ways that better match the individual who is seeking employment. Job training and ongoing support may be intensive initially and gradually reduced. This is true for supported employment too, but it's important that employers take advantage of this to make sure that there's no negative impact to their bottom line. So they take advantage of intensive training. Once a person is trained well, that support gradually fades. Next slide. So what are we waiting for? Well, I don't know what we're waiting for. I guess these are some of my musings about what we're waiting for. Part of it is that families like yourselves don't fully understand that our sons and daughters, through some of this best practice technology, can work in real community settings. Part of it is that, as compared to the 90s, CCBs and service agencies no longer understand how to do this. They don't have the, the capability of doing it anymore. Another is the state's not willing to pay for it. And that's because we have not gotten together to demand it. We know that employers are willing to embrace a diverse workforce. We've seen that time and time again. 
And I want to tell you that I believe it's critically important that we maintain the high expectations that we've always had for our sons and daughters. And we need to push the envelope on this to be able to access the services that our sons and daughters not only deserve, but that our sons and daughters have a civil right to. This is a civil right that basically is being ignored right now. So I'm asking you to join together, next slide, at the state capitol, at the local sheltered workshop, at other segregated day facilities and enclave work crew sites and let people know what do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? Thank you very much.